generally what we found was birds closer to um let's say peak production maybe due to their stress or the change in diet were more susceptible to salmonella as compared to birds that had a robust microbiome later like at the 50 weeks of age or 60 weeks of age so i think um incorporating these uh, feed additives should be done early on rather than late and I think we need to do at least two weeks, but if possible, for the entire phase in which they are susceptible for. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Poultry Nutrition Black Belt. I'm your host, Dr. Pratima Adhikari from Mississippi State University. Today, we have another guest in our episode, and today is a very special guest because he's my first PhD student, Dr. Isha Podel. Dr. Podel, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Adhikari, for having me. That's great. It's very exciting to have you in this program and to learn about, although we shared a lot in the lab about our study that we did together, but it's going to be very nice to learn about where you are now and what your current position uh, is and what what you're doing, what's your role. Can you tell us briefly? Yeah, um, so I am originally from Nepal and I, um, I was always fascinated with animals growing up. That's what led me into doing a veterinary sciences and I worked for a couple of years as a veterinary doctor in Nepal. And then I wanted to do a graduate degree and I um, contacted you and it was it was just uh, great after that. Like I came to the United States and I started a master's degree under you. And I really liked the process of research and thinking scientifically. And I wanted to continue with the PhD. So that was a great opportunity. And I think um, I've learned a lot from that. Currently, I'm working as a research scholar for a prestige department of poultry science, North Carolina State University. Over here, I work with uh, Dr. Ken Anderson, uh, Dr. Ramon, and we work mostly with laying hens, with the management and nutrition, nutritional aspect. Uh, my, my interest would be more towards feed additives and also towards um, disease uh, prevention, like salmonella, E. coli in the laying hen flock. And over here, I've been uh, writing proposals and uh, helping the lab and helping the department. Proven on the farm, trusted on the plate, let our technologies help make your production goals a reality. Learn from the experts how carbohydrates can improve nutrient utilization, gut health technologies differ by type, and how liquid smoke can light your bird performance on fire. Carry isn't just leading in animal agriculture, we're innovating it. That's great. Thank you for your nice introduction and your current role. Um, so as you mentioned, and you had a lot of these last five years, almost five years in my lab, working with Langhen, uh, mostly on the disease side and a little bit of management and nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a little bit of everything. And this current position that you have is also kind of um, entails a little bit on the extension of what you did. And I'm very excited to hear. Um, I know in today's episode, you have uh, something to share about maybe some of the things on some feed additive sides of it, right? Mm -hmm. And how they were in the in vitro, uh, applied in in vitro against uh, specifically salmonella enteritis and, and also in in vivo, right? In animal challenge studies. So would you like to share um, some of the exciting things first <laughs> that you found during your PhD study and uh, that, you know, sometimes you think that's the life maker or that's a and the, the lighting path for you. Can you share some of uh, maybe one of the research from your PhD? Yes, certainly, certainly. Uh, so and during my PhD, I work with um, developing a salmonella challenge model and then uh, uh, challenging the birds with salmonella, especially salmonella enteritis, and then seeing the effects of various uh, feed additives like uh, microbial modulators, uh, probiotic, prebiotic, essential oils, and how it can reduce salmonella. Right. So I think uh, we have just scratched the surface with our understanding of uh, how salmonella actually colonizes the intestine, and we acknowledge that there's a great role of microbiota. 
a great role of microbiota to prevent the disease and also the great role of microbiota to sustain the health of the bird. And I think in my PhD, this was one of the things that I learned that how micro, microbiota can be modulated to prevent uh, certain infections like salmonella. Uh, we, we investigated a lot of compounds during my PhD, uh, one of them being um, a bacillus-based probiotic. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, really interesting to see how a bacillus-based probiotic was able to reduce the salmonella colonization in the um, seeker as well as the fecal samples in seven days and 14 days post-infection. And this has also been shown in many previous research where bacillus has been effectively used to produce salmonella. Right. Uh, we are still understanding what mechanism might be there, but it definitely has something to do with the microbiota and uh, maybe production of but uh, butyrates mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the gut. Uh, further, we also looked at um, a completely different understanding of microbiota by uh, introducing a new type of feed additives known as microbial modulators. Mm -hmm. So this was, I think, very interesting to see how um, the microbiota is not defined by a certain species, but rather than a group of species that functions together and how we can modulate or strengthen that group to prevent salmonella infection. I think these were some of the highlights from my PhD and I, I found them really interesting. Skira, great. Yeah, that's great. It's always there's a challenge because now you have to think about not only different bird type or different location wise and not even your strain of the probiotics or um, uh, the bacteria you're using, but also there are so many other things like bird factor. Hey, I mean, I mean, every bird is different, right? Every bird are different. So, you no, know, I and then also the screening process from the lab side of it, right? The prebiotics, uh, I mean, sorry, probiotics. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, thanks. And I, I really, I totally agree on you what you shared. Um, I, I know, like, what is there as a, what is the potential for developing? And I know you mentioned a little bit on the in vitro. Now, in in vivo, we know that. Uh, you know, most of the time when you carry on this research from in vitro to in vivo, it's kind of, again, going back to what we discussed, it's kind of hard to kind of mimic on the animal body. But going back to your in vitro that you mentioned in your talk earlier, what are the, some of the uh, potential uh, for developing in vitro challenge models? Like if you would just do, okay, you do not, you have unlimited resource. Um, like what are they, for, for the feed additive side of it, can you share um, like how could this and the re impact in the research in the animal side? Can you share those? Definitely. I think uh, the way we started our in vitro challenge was uh, from a request from a company that wanted to test out a product. And uh, as you know, in vivo challenges can be expensive just because you need birds, you need um, a BSL-2 facility. So we were finding out a quick and easy method to screen a lot of products. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started investigating the in vitro. One of the primary advantages of in vitro is it can be a very good screening tool. Um, we need to still verify with an in vivo challenge, but it is a very cost effective tool in which we can have multiple uh, products and test them simultaneously and see which one is working better. We also tried to find out some synergistic effect between prebiotics and probiotics in this. And for a probiotic, we took um, lactobacillus and prebiotics, we, we took a lot of different compounds. And I think this uh, in vitro screening was... was um, uh, an effective way to uh, to pinpoint and reduce down from uh, a variety of candidates. Uh, it also reduced our dependency on, on birds, so we did not have to sacrifice any birds, and it really accelerated the selection process. Thank you for sharing those on in vitro side. Um, I know from your salmonella interactivities challenge and all these prebiotics, and uh, you've mentioned micro modulators or other probiotics you used. Um, mm -hmm. uh, can you explain some of the key finding or um, like on your nutritional this strategy side of it to reduce the interactivities and um, the window of the challenge and you know how long should we feed for and what should we be looking for to stop feeding this product or prolong feeding the product? So a lot of these uh, product feed additives, I think, should be fed for a really long time because they help to develop the microbiota. So uh, I, I definitely think they have a potential, but they need to be applied for a really long time and specifically in the times where the bird is more susceptible to uh, salmonella infection, like 
when there is a sudden diet change or when they are in, in their uh, late production phase where the effects of vaccine can really phase out. And I think these are the really crucial times where we can incorporate these feed additives to strengthen the microbiota and also prevent um, other infections like E. coli and, and, and so on. Uh, from our research, we saw that um, birds, especially younger birds, were more susceptible to salmonella. Uh, but it, yes, as you said, it can be also a, a thing about the strains and the environmental effects. But in generally, what we found was birds closer to, um, let's say, peak production, maybe due to their stress or the change in diet, were more susceptible to salmonella as compared to birds that had a robust microbiome later, like at the 50 weeks of age or 60 weeks of age. So I think um, incorporating these uh, feed additives should be done early on rather than late. And I think we need to do at least two weeks, but if possible, for the entire phase in which they are susceptible for. Elevate bird well-being and improve profitability with Cargill's tailored nutrient solutions that deliver performance. Cargill is leading through applied nutrition, leveraging deep nutrient insights and understanding of the animal's nutrient requirements to achieve your production and performance goals. Absolutely. And then we have to remember that these are not the, um, these are only preventative or control measures and not like a you know, we're trying to find a solution for antibiotics at the end, right? Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for sharing your insight and your PhD, mainly PhD research and on salmonella injury to this. Um, I really wish you a good luck on your current role. And we hope to have another episode mm -hmm. to learn about what is your current role and what your research is going on in which area and maybe in the future we can do another podcast. Do you have anything to share to the audience at the last until we wrap up? Thank you, Dr. Vikari, for having me. And I think uh, a lot needs to be learned about uh, microbiota and uh, salmonella, as well as how we can prevent this without the use of antibiotics. And I think I have to scratch the surface, um, but uh, there is still a lot to be known, and I'm excited for the future. Thank you, Ishab. Um, thank you all for listening this episode. Until we see each other next time.